back on Morning Line, final segment this morning, and uh, I want to apologize that we've got such a string of terrific guests this morning. We may not get to the phone calls, and that's my fault, but we will have opportunities throughout the week to take those. We may do some open phones as well, so stay tuned. But if you're on hold, stay there. That's fine, but I apologize for that if you're on hold, and we'll see if we get to you. But let's get back to our guest, uh, Attorney David Rabin. And David, um, I wanted to shift gears a bit here and talk a little bit about uh, the Second Avenue bombing. And, um, you know, we know now about, uh, you know, the, the bomber, the identity, and we know some of his assets and the like. And legally speaking, I mean, there have been some questions raised. One, I mean, is it possible to, we, we heard about the bomber quick deeding properties to a woman out in California, and then I think her mother, may, his mother may have ended up with another one of the properties. But is, is there a way, even though it would just be a drop in the bucket compared to the damages, that the bomber's estate could be sued by the city? Yes, uh, I've advanced that idea that his conveyance of his property to someone was certainly in contemplation of him committing a, a crime. And there's plenty of precedent that if you divest yourself of your assets in contemplation of a fraud, a court can cut right through that and seize the assets in satisfaction of a judgment. So even though his property may be worth, quote unquote, only 100000 or $200,000, Metro, the city could sue his estate for the damages that he caught, caused. Uh, of course, it is, but it's symbolic. I mean, he should he and his estate should not be able to profit from this. So, yes, there's plenty of precedent that his estate could be sued for the damages that he caused by seizing his property and this sort of thing. Okay, and another issue here, perhaps. Um, I mean, there was talk, of course, that, um, you know, there were early warning signs with regard to him, and, and maybe or maybe not, Metro Police or the FBI didn't do enough diligence to follow up on it, and now we're waiting to see for sure, one way or the other, whether the FBI declares this a terrorist act or not. Really a two-part question, then. First, maybe give me some insight from you on what will determine whether or not, and we've heard this from the FBI, it's a terrorist attack or not, and why that's important. And then the second part of that, could one of these businesses, if they feel that their insurance is not going to cover or they've been damaged, sue the city claiming negligence when it came to investigating him? Sure. That's a two-part question. First yeah. of all, most insurance policies exclude um, acts of war. Uh, so if we're at war and so an enemy bombs our house, the insurance company may not cover you. But since 9-11, <clears throat> they also exclude terrorist uh, attacks. So that they're not, re they're not, they don't have to pay for that unless you have an extra rider. So if this thing is found to be an act of terrorism, which could be very counterproductive uh, for the business owners there, uh, then they might lose their insurance coverage. Um, and that, that is possible. And of course, that would be thrown into the courts. That would not be a good thing. The other question you had is can the business owners sue the city for failing to apprehend this individual sooner? The answer to that question is no. There's a lot of precedent that there's a thing called the public duty doctrine. While the police have a duty to protect us generally, there's no duty to protect individuals in the absence of actual prior notice, that sort of thing. So generally speaking, the police department is, it cannot be sued uh, for failing to apprehend uh, this person under the public duty doctrine, and that's a settled proposition. Uh, the, the remedy, of course, is for the government to have some sort of victim compensation yeah. program, to appropriate money, to sort of spread the loss out uh, as much as they can. So as you look at this, the big picture then, I'm just curious, um, the legal side of it, are there other legal issues that, that we should be considering here as we move forward with what's happening down there from your point of view? Other things, um, those were the two that came to mind for me, but uh, what else maybe is on the table? Well, there's several issues, of course. The, the first is the communications. Uh, I was saddened to learn that all the police communications uh, are channeled through that, the police department itself has antennas uh, up on top of a big hill. I've been there, it's guarded like Fort Knox. But the problem is, is all that stuff was routed through the AT&T building, which is extremely vulnerable. But again, it's like everything else. We learn uh, from these issues, from these errors of, of consolidating our communication in a vulnerable spot. Uh, there may well be suits against AT&T um, for inability 
ability to have the communications. That I see as a possibility um, there because people weren't able to call 911 in an appropriate fashion perhaps or summon help. So AT&T itself could, could very easily be on the ropes for litigation. What, what, That's what, something what, the lawyers will be looking for. What would the argument be there then, David? I mean, they were legally in that office building as long as, I don't know, for years apparently. So, you know, what would the argument be? That they should have known better and that it was not secure enough? And how do they make that argument? The argument would be a negligence in failing to secure the, better, the building uh, better. Uh, such as putting posts out there or something like that, but it's not the building. They were legally in the building, but you create an infrastructure inside that has redundant systems in it so that if there is an explosion in one part of the building, it could be uh, picked up somewhere else. It's just like you back up your computer somewhere. I don't know if there were any backups for this thing somewhere else. So that the vulnerability of it, not to the bombing per se, but the vulnerability of the building uh, to destroy the communication network may be something. I mean, you have one man in an, R in, in an RV setting off a bomb it was, that was perhaps unanticipated, but I question about the security of the systems in there that this thing could explode and cause that much damage and shut down the communication for days. Yeah, considering just how so sure, sensitive. You have on that. Absolutely. Okay, I see that. Um, just uh, aside from that, then, um, any other potential lawsuits you see, you know, maybe coming out of this, um, you know, from any of the residents in those buildings uh, along those lines? I just, you know, wondering because you know you'll see them come eventually, one way or the other, if there are some viable cases. Well, there will be disputes, perhaps, as to how much, because if you're in one building and another building falls on you. Um, did that other building precipitate the damage uh, to you or was it independent because of the bomb? So there could be a whole host of, of lawsuits out of this. Uh, we're a litigious society and, and the damages are profound. I don't know if everybody had 100% insurance coverage, but certainly I could see, um, see that, uh, a lot of litigation out of that. And it, it is so tragic that this happened, that one person who was so demented uh, could have caused this much damage uh, and harmed us in this fashion. And you're right, to put these things together, the damage in, in Nashville by people, one person who was demented, and the da horrible damage in Washington by people um, destroying our property, which belongs to the people. I mean, we, we are vulnerable uh, in many ways, but we don't want to become a police state where, where everything is locked down and guarded. I mean, when we walk through the airports, uh, Nick, we, we, we're under constant surveillance, uh, that sort of thing. You know, we give up a lot of our freedoms to, to live that way. And that is really what these uh, terrorists, I call them terrorists, have done to us. They take away our freedoms by requiring our security to be heightened. Uh, before 9-11, we didn't have all this security. And now I think our capital will be even more secure and be more things, more cameras downtown. So we lose a lot of our freedoms and a lot of our, our, our expression and our ability to be free by these attacks on our society, which is why we should be vigilant to try to keep this from happening and create a society where hopefully this is not necessary. Yeah, I, and I think you hit on it as we wrap things up, David, but you're right, be it what we saw in Washington, D.C., and that's a larger problem in a lot of ways, or what happened here. Um, as you said earlier, then the key here is going to be moving forward, looking at what happened and finding ways to prevent it from happening again. If locally, that means moving AT&T's facilities somewhere else. If in Washington, D.C., it means getting more security out there when you see a crowd gathering, that's something you do. It's, there, there are, I guess what I want to say is that there are, there are potential solutions to these types of things, and the key is learning so it doesn't happen again. Well, the, for example, the issue regarding whether the police should or should not have searched this person's house in advance. Again, we have a Fourth Amendment in the Constitution that keeps the police from just invading your home without a search warrant. And a search warrant has to have probable cause, etc. The information that they had in retrospect, if you connect the dots, uh, maybe it, it might have been sufficient. But they, they had a very unreliable person. I believe the person was having some some issues regarding um, uh, the individual, had guns, that sort of thing. 
and so the reliability of that information was was not as much as it should have been and the police did follow up they could have done a not they did a knock and talk they contacted the fbi but it's like the 9 11 bombings in 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 retrospect you could have connected the dots and said oh how could they not have known um i think in the future we'll have more inquiries on this sort of thing i think that the bomb squad or whatever can share more information and be more aggressive in this sort of thing you would think if somebody said he has a bomb that they would have immediately gone in there but again the constitution has limitations on what the police can do and and they did follow that in retrospect again uh, perhaps it could have been different but i think we're going to learn from that and have we didn't have a police officer metro police officer i think on one of the federal squads that investigates All right this. so when you have more information going flowing between law enforcement agencies that is an issue that we have in the united states think about how many different law enforcement agencies were out there on second avenue you had atf you had the fbi you had metro police highway patrol we had what seven or eight different law enforcement agencies investigating a single crime it's appropriate that we diffuse our power in this country so one law enforcement agency doesn't take over the state but by having all this diffusion sometimes you have lacks of communication between agencies they're not on the same channel literally and figuratively so i think that needs to be enhanced as well david thank you very I much mean, for people, joining us yeah go ahead thank you very much for asking me uh, it's, it's been a pleasure thank you for joining us and uh, we'll talk again soon my friend you be safe thank you yes, sir. sir thank you sir David Raven, and actually, just as we go to break, uh, this just broke here, um, and we were talking about it. He referenced it in terms of addressing, you know, moving forward and learning from it. Chief John Drake today just now announced, the Metro um, Police Chief John Drake, that an action, an after-action review of the police department's response to the bombing suspect um, and his home back in August of 2019 when those initial reports came in will be led by five persons, including three from outside the police department. So they're going to review about how that complaint was handled and why perhaps maybe more wasn't done back then had more been done maybe what happened on second avenue would have been avoided we'll take a break and wrap things up right after this